1459, a boy was born in the capital city of the crumbling kingdom of Ava. On both sides of his family, he was descended from long dead kings who had once ruled the very land that Ava now sat in. Little did the king of Ava know the burdens that this infant would one day give to his own descendants. The boy's name was Mingyi Niao, and his ambition would lead him to become the founding member of the Tunggu dynasty of Burma, also known as Myanmar, a dynasty that would one day rule the largest empire ever formed in the history of mainland Southeast Asia. Mingyi Niao spent his formative years in the city of Ava, the current day city of Inwa. His grandfather was a general in the Avon army named Sithu Kwayatan. Due to this, he was likely raised in close proximity to the royal family of Ava, the Monyan dynasty. The head of this clan and current king of Ava was a man named Thyathura. This king, like the kings of Ava before him, was constantly under threat from powers on the borders of his kingdom and internally plagued by rebellious governors inside Ava. In 1470, one of these governors, with assistance from the Hanthanwadi kingdom to the south, incited his own rebellion. King Thyathura responded promptly, sending an army under the command of his trusted general, Sithu Kwayatin, the grandfather of Mingyi Niao. General Sithu crushes the rebellion. His prize for this victory is the job of the man he had just defeated, the governorship of Tunggu province. It's likely at this point, following his grandfather, that the 11-year-old Mingyi Niao first enters the city of Tunggu that would one day become his seat of power. Although a small periphery province of Ava, Tunggu held its own advantages. Sitting along the Sitang River, the distance from Ava to Tunggu meant that Sithu Kwayatan was on his own in terms of governing the province. With increased autonomy, there also came a price, the well-placed paranoia of the king. As the years went on, it looked as if Tunggu may revolt again under its new governor. When Sithu began repairing and building onto Tunggu's defenses in 1476, this was the last straw. On the orders of King Thyathura, Governor Sithu was dragged all the way to Ava by his own hair. Here he was thrown in front of the king, and in his humiliation was forced to explain his actions. With his obedience won by means of fear, the king of Ava sent Governor Sithu back to continue his supervision of Tunggu province. In August of 1480, the king of Ava died. His son, King Mingkong II, would succeed him. As seems to be a theme, a new king in Ava meant open rebellions from nearly all of his provinces. Three of his younger brothers opposed his coronation and prepared to raise arms against him. Two of the brothers started their opposition in the west, while the third and youngest brother began his revolt just south of Ava and directly north of Tunggu. Ava's new king called upon the assistance of Governor Sithu Kwayatin to subdue his younger brother on both of their doorsteps. The loyal governor obliges and more than confidently marches an army north. Without even waiting for extra fighting men supplied by Ava, he marches directly to the city at the center of the uprising, Yamathen. The brother of King Minkong II sends a sallying force out of the city to dislodge the Tonggu. A battle outside the town walls ensues and would see Governor Sithu defeat his foe. This was only the first wave, however. As another round of fresh soldiers crashed into his army, the men of Tonggu began to falter. In the bloodshed, Governor Sithu Kwayatin would perish. His army survived the engagement but could not sustain the siege of Yamathen and returned to Tunggu in defeat after two more months. The self-proclaimed king of Yamathen would remain independent for nearly the rest of King Minkong II's entire reign. Upon his death, the son of Sithu Kwayatin and the uncle of the now 22-year-old Mingyi Niao, a man named Min Sithu, is appointed as the new governor of Tunggu province. While King Minkong II of Ava managed to put down the rebellions of his two brothers in the west, a new set of rebellions broke out in that following year. One in the north was headed by a Thai-descended people known as the Shan, which was the largest minority group in the kingdom of Ava. A second rebellion broke out in the south, again on the very doorstep of Tonggu. 
the province of Prom. Here, the governor was a man named Thado Mintsaw. Taking advantage of Ava's turmoil, he declared his independence and proclaimed himself as the king of Prom. Ava sent an army to contest his split, but they were soundly defeated by King Thado Mintsaw. Min Sithu ruled as the governor of Tungu while the chaos of disloyal subjects surrounded him. With only a sliver of a border connecting him to his Avon overlords, he did not wane and remained loyal to Ava. In this fragile time, Mingyi Niao enters our story, asking his uncle, Governor Min Sithu, for his daughter's hand in marriage. Min Sithu, perhaps seeing through the ambitions of Mingyi Niao, rejects the proposal. He does not go quietly, however, and continues pressing for the marriage, continually facing rejection. Maybe it was true love that made him do it. Maybe it was pure, unbridled ambition. Maybe it was a mix of the two. Regardless of his motive, the outcome would be all the same. In April of 1485, Mingyi Niao conspires a plot to assassinate his uncle. The plan goes accordingly and results in the death of Governor Min Sithu. With no one in his way, the 26-year-old Mingyi Niao then marries his first cousin, Seo Min. With this marriage secured, he then names himself as the new governor of Tungu province. The unsolicited killing of a governor, and even one's kin at that matter, was usually met with strong transgression by the kingdom of Ava. In more peaceful times, it's likely that an army would have been sent to unseat Mingyi Niao, but these were far from peaceful times. Racked by multiple civil wars, the king of Ava needed every friend that he could get. Instead of declaring independence as his neighbors had, Mingyi Niao sends gifts to the king of Ava, showing his loyalty, among them being two young elephants, an animal revered in Southeast Asia as both mystical and deadly on the fields of battle. King Mingkong II accepts this tribute and allows for Mingyi Niao to continue governing Tunggu in the aftermath of his uncle's assassination. Min Sithu, for his four-year stint as governor, was quite passive, accomplishing very little. Mingyi Niao was in stark contrast to his uncle. To turn Tunggu from a tiny backwater province into a regional power, he began a campaign against the water itself. Receiving around 2,091 millimeters of precipitation annually, Myanmar ranks 27th among modern countries in terms of yearly rainfall. Combined with the many rivers that run through this land, this is simply one of the soggiest places on earth. Any campaign against the water would have been a tremendous task to undertake. For six whole years, from 1485 to 1491, Mingyi Niao builds dams along the tributaries of the Sitong River. This left room for more things like homes, rice fields, pastures, and it also left room for the more ambitious building projects of the governor. About 20 miles downstream from Tunggu, Mingyi Niao began the construction of a new city that would act as his new seat of power. Its name was Dwayawadi, and it came complete with strong walls, Buddhist temples, and an elaborate palace that was only too extraordinary for a lowly governor to reside in. The size and grandeur of one's palace often reflected the authority of the owner. The palace of Dwayawadi appeared as if a mighty king resided within. The reason for the construction of such a magnificent city quickly became apparent. A year after completion, and without permission from his Avon overlord, Mingyi Niao invades the southern kingdom of Hanthanwadi. With the death of Hanthanwadi's king in the previous year, a civil war had split the kingdom. Mingyi Niao was looking to take full advantage of this apparent weakness. The only thing standing in his way was the Shan governor of northern Hanthanwadi. To Tang Bua. Well, him and the elephant that he rode on. To spare the lives of countless men, To Tang Bua challenges Mingyi Niao to a one on one duel, not on horseback or on foot, but atop their own elephants. Putting the lance wielding, destriere riding knights of Europe to shame, if the sources are to be believed, the governor versus governor showdown began when the elephants charged toward one another. When the elephants passed one another, Mingyi Niao 
jumped from the saddle of his own elephant and atop his opponents. Here he cut down Governor Toteng Bois and won a battle by single combat. He then took his spoils, among them being slaves, buffalo, and of course, the elephant whose rider he had just slain. Ming Yi Niao would continue in annual raids of northern Hanthanwadi for the following three years. Once the civil wars of Hanthanwadi had mostly concluded in 1495, their king could now shift his attention to Tonggu. If to be believed, the king sent a massive force consisting of a thousand elephants and 160,000 fighting men north. This number is likely inflated, but it was clear that the men of Tonggu were supremely outnumbered. In conjunction with this army, Hanthanwadi also sends the majority of its fleet up the Sitang River. Hanthanwadi had mustered a devastating counterattack. They quickly overtake much of southern Tanggu. Ming Yi Niao and his army are forced to hide behind the walls of the recently built city of Dwayawadi. A siege then ensues while Hanthanwadi forces also continue to march north and begin the siege of Tonggu city itself. The province of Tonggu was on the edge of collapse. To break both sieges, Ming Yi Niao sallies out of Dwayawadi. After a few failed attempts, he would eventually find success, pushing the Hanthanwadi back to their lands. The besiegers of Tonggu evade capture by boarding their ships and retreating downstream. Ming Yi Niao, after nearly a year and a half of siege, had survived the war that he had started without permission, but just barely. Tonggu was devastated, and many of the building projects he had constituted in the first part of his reign lay in ruin. This was a learning moment for Ming Yi Niao, as he only started a war with one other entity in the region after this. As Hanthanwadi laid waste upon Tonggu, the king of Evo was distracted by his brother's continued rebellion in Yamathan. They would fight for another five years, failed siege bleeding into wet season interruption, bleeding into next year's failed siege. In 1500, the brotherly feud came to a sudden end when the king of Yamathan died unexpectedly. Yamathan, without a fight, then surrendered and returned under the fold of King Mingkong II. The 20-year rebellion of Yamathan, on top of Prom's independence and much of the northern Shan states revolting, left Ava a husk of a great kingdom. The king of Ava's strength was now similar and perhaps even weaker than his Tonggu subject. How could it get any worse than this? King Mingkong II died within a year of his own brother. His son and successor was a 15-year-old boy named Narapati, now King Narapati II. As tradition seemed to permit, when the King of Ava died, his kingdom immediately erupted with a fresh set of rebellions, this time centering mostly on the northern Shan states that one by one started to break away from Ava. Still, Tunggu remained loyal, mostly. With many inside of Ava made tired by years of endless conscription and warfare, the Burmese people began to see Tunggu as a safe alternative. Isolated away from the Avon mainland, the now hectic Irrawaddy River system, Tunggu stood as one of the few safe places in the lands of the current or former kingdom of Ava. Refugees began flooding Tunggu, which was a boon for the small, sparsely populated province. Refugees also meant harboring some of the rebellious enemies of Ava, something that Ming Yi Niao likely noticed, but pretended not to. To secure the loyalty of his most powerful governor, King Narapati II of Ava decided to give his first cousin away in marriage to Ming Yi Niao. At the marriage of Thiri Maha Sanda Dewi and Ming Yi Niao, King Narapati gifted all his remaining land that rested on the Sitang River, plus some. This included the recently reincorporated Yamathan, as well as the Kayaska Granary District, just south of Ava City. The farmland around the Kayaska Granary was some of the best agricultural land in all of Ava, yielding more than enough bundles of rice to supply Tungu's swelling population of refugees. Tiny Tungu had nearly doubled its size, and more times over, multiplied their annual revenue. King Narapati II had thought that this would guarantee Ming Yi Niao as a reliable vassal. But all he had really done was give away his most valuable land to a man 
who was plotting his own downfall. Only two years after the marriage and land concessions, Mingyi Niao formally betrayed Eva. In 1504, he entered into an open alliance with the neighboring king of Prom, Thado Minsa, the former vassal and current enemy of Eva. The so-called loyal governor had finally shown his true colors. Tunggu was now all but an independent state, with Mingyi Niao at its head. The southern invasion of the newly aligned Prom and Tunggu began a few months later and lasted for nearly an entire year. Although weakened, the king of Ava held out against these attacks and managed to keep his former vassals at bay until the wet season pushed for their retreat. In the next year of 1505, the king of Prom made yet another alliance, this time with Saolin Amoyin, a leader of a newly created confederation of Shan states. This patchwork of ethnically Shan, Chinese, and Siamese towns, villages, and cities had found a competent leader to unite them and focus their combined might on their former overlord. Ava was now caught in a pincer from north to south, made possible by the diplomacy of Thado Minsa of Prom. Not skipping a beat, Thado Minsa and Saolin begin their own invasion of Ava. The pair raided deep into Ava from opposite sides and nearly met in the middle. Had they met, it might have spelled the end of Ava. The forces of Naropati II barely managed to outlast the combined invasion until the rescue of the wet season came in the following year of 1506. The yearly raids of Prom continued in 1507, this time enlisting the help of their Tonggu ally. Again, the raids pushed deep into Ava until the relief of the rainy season in 1508. The dual alliance of Prom and Tengu attacked again in 1509, but this time it was different. What were simply yearly raids had culminated into an outright conquest. Prom captured more land north and along the Irrawaddy River, while Tungu filled out their own western border with Prom. On October 16th of 1510, Mingyi Niao formally declares the independence of Tungu from Ava. Even though the overlord and subject had been at war for the past six years, to accompany the creation of this new kingdom, Mingyi Niao built another grand city along the Sitang River, this one being only a few miles north of Tunggu City. The city would take the name of the Buddhist paradise on earth, Ketumati. It would later become the modern day city of Tunggu after the former's destruction in the coming century. With a palace even grander than the last one built at Dwayawadi, there was now no way to question it. This was the home of a king. After the completion of Katumati, Mingyi Niao formally crowned himself as the independent king of Tunggu. On April 11th of 1511, Mingyi Niao became the first king of the Tunggu dynasty. No one, not even Ava, contested this action. As Prom and the Shan states continued in unending warfare against the kingdom of Ava, King Mingyi Niao's reign was the most peaceful of all of Ava's former territories. For 15 whole years, there was no military incursion made in or out of Tunggu. Tunggu became an even more attractive spot for refugees from the wars to the north, swelling the manpower of the new kingdom. The long peace finally came to an end in 1525. In March of 1525, the combined forces of the Shan states and Prom probed deep into Ava, their armies meeting near the city of Ava itself. They promptly began a siege and sacked much of the city, with only the palace walls managing to hold out. A last-ditch attempt from King Naripati II of Ava to reassemble his kingdom would see him try to regain the whole of Tunggu province. The choice to focus on a sneak attack against Tunggu and not Prom for the Shan states was a bold move, but probably his best option. A month after the sack of Ava, in April of 1525, King Naripati II marched on Tunggu and besieged Mingyi Niao at his capital of Ketumati. The 65-year-old king, after 15 years of passivity, 
easily led a successful defense of his capital, and the Avens retreated within a month. Although defeated, King Narapati did manage to recapture the lush lands around the Kayakska granary. Tungu and its king returned to their peaceful neutrality. Two years later, the final nail in the coffin was hammered into the kingdom of Ava. Prom and Saolin Shan states attacked the kingdom for the final time. This campaign would see another siege of the capital and its eventual fall. King Narapati II of Ava would die in the city's defense as the final king of a 163-year dynasty that ruled over much of modern Myanmar. The son of Salen, Thohenboa, was then crowned as the new Shan King of Ava. Most of the former Avon lands fell under the domain of King Thohenboa, with Prom annexing only a bit of land to their north. Ava had fallen. A new ethnic group, the Shan, had taken over in their place. This led the Burmese majority of Ava to retreat into the most stable kingdom in the region, the peace-loving realm of King Mingyi Niao's Tunggu. These new refugees would have some obstacles in their way to Tunggu, however. King Mingyi Niao worried that Saolin and his Shan states wouldn't stop at their conquest of Ava. In a preemptive defensive action, the king ordered for his northern borderland to be laid waste to. Trees were cut down, dams were flooded, wells were poisoned, and the population was evacuated. The attack from Saolin never came, but King Mingyi Niao was prepared nonetheless. Three years later, on November 24th of 1530, King Mingyi Niao would pass away at the age of 71 in his capital city. He would be succeeded by his only son, Taban Shwedi. Mingyi Niao was as shrewd politically as they ever came. From his early grasp at power, with the assassination of his uncle, and all the way to his patient, and perhaps overdue, independence from Ava. Where others were eager to split from Ava as fast as possible, the founder of the Tunggu dynasty waited for the perfect moment to separate from his overlord. His 20-year reign as a king would see Tunggu become an island of stability in a Burma plagued by systemic warfare. His realm provided a safe place for the Burmese culture to reside in as their kingdom was destroyed. At the start of his reign as governor, Tunggu was a small, backwater, and underdeveloped province. By the end of his life, Tunggu held the majority of the Sitong River and was among the most prosperous lands in all of Myanmar. <laughs>